Hi. Let me start by reading a couple little vignettes to you, and then we'll get into stuff that's more substantial. When the first of the two 767s hit the Twin Towers at 8.46 a.m., I was standing behind my desk on the south side of the 68th floor of One World Trade Center in the Public Affairs Department of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. I was nearly knocked to the floor by the impact of the first plane, which slammed into the north side of Tower One, more than 20 floors above me. I heard a loud thud, followed by an explosion. The building felt like it swayed about 10 feet to the south. It shuddered back to the north and shimmied back and forth. Out of the window, I saw a parabola of flame fall toward the street, followed by a blizzard of paper and glass. Then I heard two sounds, emergency sirens on the street and phones ringing across the 68th floor, calls from reporters wondering what had happened. Within a few minutes, we gathered the staff through files and notepads into our bags and prepared to evacuate the floor. It began to fill with grainy smoke. Phone rang. I picked up the phone. Greg Trevor here. Hi, I'm with NBC National News. If you could hold on for about five minutes, we're going to put you on for a live phone interview. I'm sorry, I can't. We're evacuating the building. But this will only take a minute. I'm sorry, you don't understand. We're leaving the building right now. He seems stunned. But this is NBC National News. Apparently, I don't have to risk my life for the local NBC affiliate, but no sacrifice is too great for NBC National News. Then we reached the floor just before 10 a.m., going downward. We heard a loud rumble. The building shook violently. I was thrown from one side of the stairwell to the other. We didn't know it at the time, but Tower 2 had just collapsed. Our stairwell filled with smoke and concrete dust. Breathing became difficult. The lights died. A steady stream of water about four inches deep began running down the stairs. It felt like we were wading through a dark, dirty, rapid river at night in the middle of a forest fire. The smartest decision I made that day was to wear a knit tie to work. I put the blue tie over my nose and mouth to block the smoke and dust. To keep from hyperventilating, I remember the breathing exercises my wife and I learned in Lamaze classes. Someone yelled that we should put our right hand on the shoulder of the person in front of us and keep walking down. We descended one more flight to the fourth floor when I heard someone say, oh shit, the door's blocked. The force from the collapse of Tower 2 had apparently jammed the emergency exit. We were ordered to turn around and head back up the stairs to see if we could transfer to another stairwell. Now we were wading against the current of the dark, dirty river. Others were still trying to walk down. People were starting to panic. For the first time, I was afraid we wouldn't make it. I whispered a quick prayer, Lord, please let me see my family again. The second account. Those that escaped the fire were slain with the sword, some hewed to pieces, others run through with their rapiers, so as they were quickly dispatched, and very few escaped. It was conceived they thus destroyed about 400 at this time. It was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire, and the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink and scent thereof. But the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and they gave their prayers thereof to God, who had wrought so wonderfully for them, thus to enclose their enemies in their hands, and to give them so speedy a victory over so proud and insulting an enemy. What's the first account from? Don't know that. What's the first account from? 911. What's the second account from? No one knows that, right? It's William Bradford's History of the Plymouth Plantation. It's an account of Puritans slaughtering Pequot Indians. Now think of these two episodes, which occur uh, almost 400 years apart. In one case, you have religious fundamentalists who are trying to attack civilians as a form of terror warfare in order to get a political message across and to get a particular objective. Okay, Which one would that be? Both, right? The language is really strikingly similar. I mean, you know, look at, look at what uh, uh, Bradford, who was the governor of Plymouth Colony, said. <clears throat> they gave their prayers there to God, who had wrought so wonderfully for them to enclose their enemies in their hands and give them a speedy victory over so proud and insulting an enemy. This is precisely the kind of rhetoric we heard after 911. So, what's the point of opening with these two accounts? Well, terrorism, I mean, if, if we today's paper, Aftermath of Terror. It's a word we hear all the time, right? What is terrorism today? We have a particular image of it, don't we? It's, it's Muslim, it's Arab, it, it can be other things, but it generally fits into that pattern. Uh, people blowing up uh, train stations in Madrid or you know, buildings in New York City or uh, taking hostages in Riyadh, wherever. 
So this is something that's obviously become a major facet. It has been for some time, but clearly in the last few years, it's become a major facet of our lives. It determines and shapes pretty much everything we do, whether you're at Code Orange or whether you have the Attorney General coming out and making some kind of statement about the, you know, the threat or the sleeper cells or the dirty bombs or whatever. It's kind of everywhere. And so the point of this course is to give it, I think, context. Um, as I said earlier, um, I've pretty much taught this before as U.S. foreign policy. To some extent, this is a name change. And I'm doing it, you know, for marketing purposes as much as anything else. But I also think it's important today to kind of get this, uh, 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 these ideas across in a historical perspective, uh, which is why we're going to talk about war and globalization and, and terrorism. Uh, is terrorism simply the act of uh, a, a renegade, you know, group, Al Qaeda or someone like that, uh, which targets, uh, uh, you know, individuals, you know, citizens, people like that, in order to get a point across, or can it be something else? I mean, these are the kind of issues we're going to talk about. Um, as the course develops, we're not going to, I'm not going to say, okay, this is terrorism, this is globalization. It's going to kind of overlap everything we've done. Um, my own uh, uh, interpretation of that is that uh, terror is pretty broad. These are pretty broad concepts. And so terrorism isn't simply flying planes into buildings on September 11th. It can also be uh, a Puritan militia attacking Pequot Indians and slaughtering all of them as part of the purpose. To, the goal of the Pequots that day was to kill the women and children in order to send a message out, you know, basically, don't mess with the British. This is our land. We're going to take it from you. So it's terror warfare. Um, in the same vein, I think, uh, you know, recently we've heard a lot of talk about atrocities and warfare. Um, revelations from Iraq at Abu Ghraib prison. And some people have talked about Vietnam and My Lai. We'll probably talk about that later in the semester. Uh, and probably you're familiar with the My Lai massacre where American soldiers went in and executed about 400 Vietnamese civilians in one day. Uh, in that very same quarter, that year, 50,000 people were killed in that same area uh, by American air attacks. That's not terrorism. That's not an atrocity. That's warfare. So these are the kinds of things we're going to have to flesh out. Uh, as the semester progresses. So we're going to talk about war and terrorism and globalization, but all these themes are going to kind of overlap and, and, and become the kind of superstructure of the entire class. So um, always keep those in mind as we talk about particular events and incidents. That's why I began that way, because there is clearly a continuity. And um, I think one thing that, that many things I hopefully will get across, but one is this kind of sense of exceptionalism that was really punctured on 911. This doesn't happen here. This is a different world. We've lost our, our naivete. But in fact, if you go through history, these, these accounts, these, these things are really kind of common. Uh, they're not that unusual. And um, we'll see time and again that they happen to Americans. Americans committed these kinds of activities. This is part of kind of uh, the way that the world is structured and international relations take place. Uh, so this is a theme that's going to be common as we go through. Um, Bob Bazanka, which you probably figured out by now, and this is history 3394. Um, for the for future generations, uh, we're taping this in the summer of 2004. So every now and then you will hear a reference if you're watching it years from now, and it may not make sense. So we forgive forgive us for that. Um, a little bit about the class. Um, I think most of you have a syllabus already, which is pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, it's mostly going to be a class with talking, me talking, hopefully you talking as well. The more that um, you folks become involved in the class, then certainly the better off um, we all are. Uh, if you want to get info, you can go to my webpage, which has this really long and unwieldy address, or you can just do a Yahoo or Google search on it, and then you can go down to war, terrorism, and globalization, which is right there. And click on that. And then it gives you the most important stuff, which is kind of the syllabus and the outlines. The syllabus is there. And again, it's pretty much self-explanatory. It has the books. It has the uh, assignments, uh, uh, the topics we're going to cover, the readings, and so forth. Uh, stay up to date on that. And um, Maybe more important for our purposes, we're going to have outlines on it, too. I don't use PowerPoint, so I'll just kind of do this. Uh, I have five up. There'll be more as the semester progresses. And these are pretty simple. They're just uh, major accountings of the major ideas we're going to talk about. Today, it's, it's especially kind of a background or so. There's not going to be a whole lot to it. As the semester goes on, 
there may be links to documents or articles or images or something like that that are appropriate, but for today probably uh, we won't be um, doing as much of that. Um, if any of you have any questions at any time, make sure you ask. Uh, read the syllabus closely. Um, it's very important to get on the email list I've set up. That's a good way of kind of getting information out to everybody. Uh, so um, make sure you, um, you look at that. Okay. Um, we're going to start then by talking about some of the major themes that really encompass what this class is all about. Wars, so-called terrorism, it's a term that's really unwieldy, one that I don't particularly like. Uh, globalization, which is a term that's really been around forever, I know. Uh, uh, in the last five years, that seems to become a very, uh, have become a very sexy academic topic, globalization. We're teaching courses on it, and people are writing books about it, and, uh, you know, people are giving talks and things like that. Um, and this, too, like terrorism, has been around for a long time. Uh, Columbus's voyages, obviously, were a form of globalization. Uh, the type of globalization we have today has really kind of had a long heritage in the U.S., a long legacy, and we'll talk about that as well. So let's start by just kind of doing some background on the themes that we're going to cover this semester. What I like to do at the beginning is kind of get all this out, and then that way I don't have to keep going back and making reference to it. These ideas, just make sure you keep in the back of your head, though, because in, in the future when we talk about things, I'm not going to say, okay, this is an example of globalization. You'll say, oh, you know, uh, the conquest of Cuba and the Philippines, that's part of the globalizing mission. Or uh, subduing the Philippine insurrectionists and killing 100,000 of them. Well, that's part of terrorism, terrorism or whatever. I mean, I just, you need to be able to make these connections on your own. I'm not going to always be there to say this is what this means, okay? So I want to start then a little bit with, with kind of some of these major themes. And, and there are several, but I've kind of taken a few and uh, uh, kind of narrowed them down. Commercial expansion, trade, which are very similar, security, and, and, and mission, meaning kind of a missionary uh, aspect. Um, I think that, that the major theme driving America in the world, driving most major industrialized countries in the world, is the desire for commercial expansion, the desire for trade the desire to find countries in which you can invest, in which you can find resources, in which you can find cheap labor, with whom you can trade, right? That's going to be the greatest motivation for American expansion, for America to step out into the world and find areas to either intervene in or to trade with or to negotiate with or to have some kind of a relationship with. So the greatest theme is going to be commercial expansion. Later on, I'll talk about something called the open door, which is going to be really critical to this, and that's going to be kind of a nice little catchphrase, you know, buzzword that we're going to use time and again, the open door. If you're familiar with, you know, global events in the last several years, you've probably heard of the World Trade Organization or NAFTA or CAFTA or the FTAA, these kind of alphabet soup of international trade organizations. This is the same thing that took place, you know, over the course of well over a century. This, this goal is to find an open door, to find areas where you can trade, where you can invest, where you can find cheap labor, where you can find resources. Uh, uh, it is also the cause, I would argue, of a lot of what we would call terrorism and war today. This, this search for resources, this unequal distribution of resources, uh, the, the need for an open door, or in some countries, the need for a closed door. We'll talk more about this. This is just kind of a major theme. So this is going to be something we're going to talk about. Security. The United States is very fortunate because security concerns haven't been as great as in many other places. Continental Europe, for instance, which is very compact and has a lot of countries which share borders and have different uh, uh, interests. The United States is, is very fortunate by virtue of geography to uh, dominate uh, North America, to have uh, a country to the north with, with which it has good relations, and to essentially have the southern countries as virtual colonies per things like the Monroe Doctrine, but also the reality of American intervention and economic interest there. So uh, uh, security clearly is a concern. It's one that's used all the time. Security is more important as, I think, a rallying point for Americans as a way for uh, uh, people who run the government, who run the economy, people who I refer to as a ruling class, to essentially get what they want by invoking security. The best example of that would be the Cold War Red Scare, which we'll talk about, you know, subsequently. If, you know, we don't remain vigilant, if we don't spend uh, billions of dollars on military equipment, if we don't have a, a security apparatus internally, McCarthyism, Patriot Act, you name it, 
then our security will be affected. Uh, national security is invoked all the time. It's invoked as a, as a controlling tool rather than as reality. American security has never really been uh, at stake. I mean, 911, for instance, was an attack on a couple of, of buildings in New York, and, and no one can deny the horror of that. At the same time, uh, was it, uh, did it affect the security of the United States in the, in the long term? No. I mean, the U.S. is not about to be invaded or attacked by anybody, despite uh, uh, claims of weapons of mass destruction or, or whatever else. The United States has no rival in the world today. There are countries, the old, the old, uh, the the, the ex-Soviet republics have nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. The reality of it is, however, is that the U.S. is not currently under danger from some kind of external force. Not to suggest that things like. Uh, you know, hijacking planes aren't a reality or, or blowing up train stations. Those are clearly a danger and, and it would be foolish to suggest they aren't. And, and so, and that is an element of security, but uh, in terms of kind of geographic security, continental security, that's not. However, from time to time that will be invoked. And finally, mission, and that's something that's really kind of fuzzy and squirrely to work with. From time to time, I, I kind of tend to downplay it, but uh, we're in an era right now where I think it's very important. Um, there's been this sense, really, from the time the Americans uh, uh, established, uh, uh, settled in North America and then established a republic, uh, that the U.S. was kind of exceptional, that the Americans were kind of exceptional, that they were set down in this new continent you know, as a way of kind of fulfilling a mission. It's a Christian mission. It's God's mission. Uh, uh, the Americans are, are going to bring civilization and Christianity and, and republicanism and free markets. And there's this whole kind of set, this whole structure. Right? And, and, and in that, then, you can justify you know, slavery or taking over Indian lands or uh, you know, a, a holy war uh, against Islam or, or whatever you want. And this works the same way, which is why you know, the, the irony there, I think, of 911 is we heard all this talk about Muslim fundamentalism. But if you look at the rhetoric of, let's say, Osama bin Laden and George Bush, it's really strikingly similar. You have what's the, the boondocks cartoon about the, uh, the spoiled son of a rich guy who caters to religious fundamentalists or something like that. And, and he's actually talking about Bush. And there's actually a good book out called Clash of Fundamentalisms, which basically makes that point that Bush and Osama are very similar. So this is part of the missionary aspect. Uh, uh, this is a country which has a separation of church and state, but it's also a country which is inherently theological. And the Pequot War, the first account I read, was a very good example of that, remember? We want to give our thanks to God, because God made those Indians you know, be there so we could slaughter 400 of them and their blood would quench the fire. Right? Uh, and you know, I'll read accounts of, of similar circumstances like that as we go through. So these are, and again, I'm not going to say this is an example of mission or this is an example of trade. This just is kind of part of it. Uh, uh, these major themes, globalization, terrorism, commercial expansion, missionary ideas, those kind of flow, those have to kind of, those will kind of travel through the contours of everything we do. So I'm not going to say this is an example of or whatever. It, it, it'll be, I think it'll be pretty obvious here. You're all fairly, you know in tune to this, you're historians and you like history and you know you have nothing better to do this summer than to sit in a classroom on a hot day, so we'll get it all. All right. Um, anybody have any just basic questions about any of this stuff before I actually start doing history? Because I haven't been so far, right? I've been talking and uh, one other thing, because somebody asked me up front, like, you know, what I thought about certain ideas. It'll become pretty clear very early on that I'm pretty critical of a lot of this. The stuff I've written, some of which you'll read, has made that abundantly clear. By no means, however, am I going to enforce any kind of orthodoxy. I'm not going to stand up here and say, you're either with me or you're with the terrorists, okay? So if you want to challenge some interpretation of some idea, please feel free to throw it out there. I think we'd all be better off uh, if that happened. Um, so uh, uh, I am very critical of a lot of this. Uh, you'll see that the conception, you know, for example, the conception of terrorism I have is actually quite broad. Uh, I think that the Pequot War, if, if, if blowing up the, the towers on 911 is terrorism, then wiping out the Pequots the way that the, the Puritans did was terrorism. Uh, I think uh, killing 50,000 Vietnamese using B-52s is terrorism. So it's a pretty broad concept that, that, I, in, 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 that I employ. Here, uh, basically, you know, when uh, the people attacked are not the cause of one's distress or the cause of a threat, uh, when they're kind of ancillary, or to use that very, you know, beautiful Orwellian term, uh, uh, collateral damage, 
right? Uh, then, then that's that's terror. That's terror warfare. And the idea there, and, and this has actually been written about, you know, quite extensively in, in military literature, is to terrorize a population, to get them to want to, you know, surrender, to not want to fight because they live in fear. All right. So, it's a term I'll use fairly broadly. Let me start a little bit with some of these major themes. Uh, the first and most important of which I think is commercial expansion. And you can kind of see that from, from the beginning, from the 18th century. Uh, if you remember, you've probably taken History 1377 or some similar course somewhere, 1301 at ACC. Uh, and you learned a little bit about the, uh, the settlement of British North America. And one of the major events in that was the Seven Years War, the uh, French and Indian War, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and as a result of that, France was kicked out of, of North America. The British won a, a decisive victory. The Americans were quite happy with that. Why? Is it because they didn't like the French? You know, they, they renamed them Freedom Fries, right, back in 1763. Not necessarily. It was because with France gone, new areas were going to be open for commercial exploitation. France was an obstacle to development. And these are terms that you're going to hear all the time, too. Development, modernization, you know, it's, it's stuff that we heard a lot of in the mid-20th century, but it's really the same stuff they were talking about in the 18th century as well. So with France gone, um, the Americans see great opportunities now in what would today be the Midwest. At the time, it was called the Northwest Territory. So uh, uh, there's this, this desire now for expansion, okay? Uh, clearing the land. You know, removing obstacles to development. The Pequot War is a good example of that, and there are other cases like that. Bacon's Rebellion actually involves Indian uh, uh, politics too, and you can see that time and again. We'll talk more about it. Uh, uh, but um, uh, uh, what happens after the uh, the French and Indian War clearly then is this move, this decisive move toward developing ultimately an independent state based on the idea of gaining markets and having a free trade system. This isn't the most exciting stuff in the world, but it's really critically important. It still drives policy today. Right? I mean, the idea of markets and trade. Look at what's the most important commodity being traded in the world today? Oil. Okay? And clearly, you can't discuss international politics today without talking about oil. You haven't been able to for a century. Right? This is the same idea. We need to find markets. We need to find resources. We need to be able to have a, a mechanism for trade uh, to get access to, to petroleum and, and so forth. Um, in the 1700s, however, the world wasn't, wasn't structured along these kinds of lines where you had what were called free or private, which is a better term, markets, or free trade. Uh, the world was organized by colonies, right? It was an imperial world. You had major empires with colonies. The system they employed was called mercantilism. A mercantilist system means you have colonies which provide you with resources, provide you with uh, a consumer base, for instance. I mean, if you make stuff, you need to have to have a place to sell it. So you have a colonial system where you force these people to buy your manufactured products, where you get raw materials. The British, for instance, use North America for that, for things like lumber and fish and um, tobacco, you know, various commodities like that. Uh, you have a place to trade, you have a place to invest, you have a place to, uh, for example, the British saw North America as a great place to send excess population. It's a vent when you have problems, you know, when, when the social system becomes a little bit too, uh, too chaotic and when there's unemployment or disease, you can you know, ship off your unwanteds and you send them to the New World. So all of that is part of the mercantilist system. Well, the Americans don't want to go that route, mainly because as an upstart colony, they can't compete that way. Right? You have the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the French, the, the Dutch. The Americans can't compete in that kind of a world. The, the world is already being carved up. So the Americans are going to take a different approach, and they will throughout the, the next you know, uh, uh, centuries. And this is going to be really important. Later on, we'll call it the open door. It's not, that's not the phrase they use yet. The Americans understand that they can't create a major empire. So they want to create a global world based on free trade, based on commercial opportunity rather than on mercantilism or, 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 uh, or traditional imperialism. Now, there had been kind of an intellectual movement throughout Europe in Britain and France, where a lot of writers, a lot of theorists, the kind of people who today would be on, you know, uh, uh, McNeil Lair or the, or the morning talk show with Tim Russert, these kind of guys, 
uh, they'd be writing on the internet, salon.com or whatever. These kind of guys started writing about the need to restructure the world away from this kind of power-oriented structure where you know people dominate when, when major countries dominate other countries toward one which is based mostly on trade. And so they're suggesting now that global diplomacy should consist mostly of commercial exchange between individuals, not between states, but between private individuals who trade you know, commercial uh, representatives, traders, merchants. So the, the new idea is that states shouldn't be fighting wars. States should be there to create an atmosphere conducive to trade. And in fact, if this works well, the more trade that takes place, how will that affect the likelihood of war? What would the theory be? It'll diminish it, right? I mean, there'd be less likelihood of conflict if countries have a vested interest in making sure that they have, you know, kind of commercial relations with, with one another. Uh, in addition to this then, so the first goal is to have free trade, to have this kind of uninterrupted commerce without barriers, right? Trade with everybody. That's the best way to get along, is to trade with everybody. You can have prosperity and peace that way. In addition to that, that also enables you to avoid what they often refer to back in the 1800s as entanglements with other countries. What's an entanglement? What do you think they mean when they say we need to avoid entanglements? What's an entanglement? Yeah, c disputes. Hmm? conflict, disputes, basically, but, but even more than that, what they mean is to, to not become so intertwined with another country, like a colonial imperial relationship would have, so that you lose your own ability to act independently or with sovereignty. All right, an entanglement uh, uh, it would be an alliance, for instance. Uh, you know, the United States is part of NATO, so it's committed to to, to being part of you know kind of NATO's decision-making process. Or, or uh, the United Na a lot of people oppose the United Nations because they see it as being entangling. Or uh, uh, America's relationship in the Middle East with Israel, which you know the U.S. gives them. Uh, tremendous amount of money, billions and billions of dollars every year, and therefore essentially supports Israel's policies in that region. People would say that might be an entanglement. So part of it is free trade, part of it is avoiding entanglement. Tom Paine said, Europe is our market for trade. We ought to form no partial connection with any part of it. It is in the true interest of America to steer clear of European contentions. So the idea there is we have a market, let's use that market, but stay away. Because in Europe, what's happening? The British and the French are fighting all the time. It's a big mess. All right. So time and again, you're going to have this come. And it's going to be a major theme in, in, in this whole you know, period for two centuries, that we need to establish these areas for commerce, for trade. But we really need to stay out of the disputes of it. Now, in the 20th century, we'll find out that's not really possible, is it? Okay. The theme here, one that I'll talk about later, that we're going to talk about is essentially liberalism. Okay. What these guys are trying to do is create a liberal world. People like Thomas Paine and John Adams. And in fact, Adams in 1775 created something he called the Model Treaty right here, which uh, uh, was a, a, a kind of a theory which suggested that if the Americans declare independence, then they need help from France because the French hate the British. And what should the Americans offer France? Well, according to traditional diplomacy, traditional arrangements, you would offer them, you know, land or territory or or a share of, you know, your your winnings or something like that. Adams is suggesting doing something totally different and offering them commercial opportunity, free trade, most favored nation status, kind of things that are still around today. All right, that's the model treaty. It's an entirely, I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, it doesn't sound like any big deal today, right? It's really revolutionary in the 18th century. This is a world based on empire, based on conquest, based on force and coercion. And Adams is saying, we can do things differently. We need commercial exchange between states, but nothing else. Not contentions, not alliances, not disputes, not wars, not conflicts. Let's stay away from that as much as we can, right? So, uh, 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 uh. As a result, then, what the Americans want to offer is uh, a commercial treaty, commercial opportunities with other countries. Commerce is often referred to as free ships or free seas or, or free goods. Okay? This is part of the planning for empire. This is the long-term plan for empire. There's a huge dispute as to whether the United States is imperial, has an imperial past, can be considered an empire. Most Americans 
probably up until five or six years ago, overwhelmingly would have said, no way. The U.S. is not an empire. It has no imperial past. In the last several years, there's kind of been a resurgence of imperial rhetoric, though, and a new analysis. And so you're starting to kind of start to see people envision the U.S. differently, right? Uh, what the U.S. essentially has is, using the term I introduced a minute ago, a liberal empire. What's that mean? Liberalism, which is the kind of stuff that Adams and Paine were talking about, essentially means free trade. What's liberalism mean today? The term means something quite different, doesn't it? When you think of liberal today, what do you think of? Who or what? You think of things like the Democratic Party, maybe, or certain members of the Democratic Party. You think of things like you know, uh, pro-choice or affirmative action or you know, gay rights or something like that. Generally, liberalism in the 20, late 20th, 21st century has become revolved around social issues kind of, you know, personal freedom issues. Liberalism never meant that traditionally. Liberalism has always actually been a form of political economy, a liberal political economy, it's from Adam Smith down. Liberalism means you have unfettered, unbarriered trade. You trade with as many countries as you can, and as part of that, you have free institutions. Why do you have free institutions? Because free institutions facilitate trade. Modernization, development, all of those things will facilitate commercial opportunity. If you're going to trade with another country, you're better off if that country has the same kind of institutions you do, open, free, republican institutions, because then they too can progress and develop and modernize. So this is trade liberalism. This is economic liberalism. It's the political economy of liberalism. And they are trying to create in the 18th and 19th century, when I say they, I'm talking about the founders, the ruling class, you know, the Adams and, and, and Payne and Jefferson and Hamilton, the, the kind of usual suspects. They're trying to create an empire, a global empire. They already have this vision. Hamilton especially is really brilliant and incredibly brilliant and far-sighted guy. Hamilton believes that the key to having uh, uh, an empire will be to develop an industrialized country and then to use that as a springboard to move out, to move abroad. All right, now, so that's one form of empire. There's another form of empire which the Europeans are practicing, and what's that? What do they do? It's not liberal, it's... It's, it's typical imperialism. What does that involve? What kind of things do they do? Yeah. You, you go in, you take over a country, you colonize it. You, you actually send your armies in, you occupy it, you put your people in charge. All right? So this is kind of what we're looking at then. And, and you can see this early on. This, this new form of imperialism, which is actually going to be far more effective, versus this kind of more traditional sense of imperialism. So you have liberal imperialism versus this kind of European or traditional imperialism. And so... Uh, 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 you see this then, you know, you can see this in the, in the late 1800s. As soon as the Americans declare uh, uh, independence, as soon as they defeat the British, you see this move now to establish free trade, free ships, free goods. The idea there is that commerce, which is going to be maritime commerce, of course, you don't have airplanes or anything like that, no trucks or anything like that. The idea there then will be that commerce will be the key to prosperity and peace. It will be a liberal world. It won't be, we're not going to do it like the Europeans. We're not going to send our armies in to conquer and occupy other territories. We're going to do it differently. Now, of course, what we'll find out in the 20th century is you can't. It doesn't work that way. Liberalism will become coercive. It almost necessarily has to. Okay? But that's not the idea you know, that you see when this kind of idea of developing markets and, and, and trade comes up. Now, as a flip side to that, this is something I just want to briefly introduce because it's something we're going to talk about more later, especially in the Cold War era in the 60s and then in, in contemporary times. There are domestic aspects to this as well. If you're going to have this kind of a, of a global reach, if you want a global reach that, that expands all over and finds markets and finds areas to invest in places where you can get resources or where you can get cheap labor or where you can sell stuff, markets for sales, then you have to make sure that within the home country, people are on board. And one way to do that is to have an enforced and, and, and which can be fairly rigid type of social control. Right? And you often do this through the fear of security, something I talked about a few minutes ago. And a good example of that took place in the 1790s. In the 1790s, the Americans were variously involved in trade disputes with both Britain and France. And in France, actually, there was almost a war. It was called the Quasi-War. OK? 
Okay, uh, there was a war with Britain then in, in 1812, War of 1812, right? So these trade disputes emerged. Now those become part of internal political disputes as well between the two major parties at the time, the Republicans and the Federalists. The Republicans were considered the pro-French party. As a result of that, the Federalists passed laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts, which essentially made it a crime to criticize the, the Federalists. So if you criticized the war, if you criticized John Adams, who was president, or if you criticized Federalist officials, you could actually be arrested and jailed. Okay, what is the point of these kinds of coercive measures? Okay, why do you, why do you use this kind of heavy-handed political threat? Why do you want to do that? Okay, but are they simply trying to go after subversive? Is this simply, you know, saying, well, if somebody, you know, suggests that we, you know, you know, give up the country? I mean, it's it's not it's not that extreme, is it? Basically, they're saying if you criticize the president, but your point is right. Basically, they're saying we need we have this threat of internal subversion. We need to stop that. The threat of internal subversion is actually the Republican Party who is suggesting that the Americans not be anti-French. Anti so it's very, it's very, you know, very mellow. It's not, not at all extreme. But the point here is that the state is willing to use its power to enforce what it would consider the correct way of thinking, where it would enforce patriotism or loyalty or security. And when we talk about the Cold War and McCarthyism, the same thing will come up. The idea there is that if you criticize this country in this particular time, then you're actually giving you know, support to the enemies of freedom and democracy. It's, it's the Patriot Act. It's the exact same thing. That's why I introduced it now, because this is one of the first real examples you're going to see, the Alien and Sedition Acts, where as a result of this kind of goal to develop this new empire, this new liberal empire, uh, uh, the people in charge are willing to take coercive measures to enforce an orthodox view of the way that uh, uh, the state should be structured. So that if you disagree with this particular path, then you are, you know, almost ipso facto, subversive, and you need to be dealt with. All right. So that's something I kind of just wanted to introduce because it's a, it's it's something that we're going to be uh, uh, talking about um, more f more frequently, you know, as as we go on. Um, so it's pretty clear then that. Uh, uh, this, this kind of liberal globalization mission is already in place. And in fact, when he leaves office, George Washington in 1797 says, and this is his farewell address, harmony, liberal intercourse with all nations are recommended by policy, humanity, and interest. But even our commercial policy should hold an equal and impartial hand, neither seeking nor granting exclusive favors or preferences, consulting the natural course of things, diffusing, diffusing and diversifying by gentle means the streams of commerce, but forcing nothing. In all that kind of very clumsy rhetoric, what Washington is saying is we need to find markets. We need to have a liberal trade policy, not making deals or not having alliances but simply to allow commerce to flow naturally. All right? So it's clear then, this is 1797, that this is already in place. The kind of things we see today with the World Trade Organization or NAFTA or the International Monetary Fund, uh, any of that is, is in place two centuries uh, earlier. All right? As a result then, the Americans are now an independent country and uh, um, the, the, the mission of expanding begins uh, really immediately. Um, in the first census of 1790, uh, only 4% of the entire population lived outside of the, um, the kind of eastern coast, the eastern seaboard, the coastline that we know today. And, and it grows after that. So the first goal then is to expand continentally, right? And um, the Louisiana Purchase is part of that. I have a map which I can show later, which kind of shows expansion. So the Louisiana Purchase is part of that, where the, the size of the country doubles by purchasing territory. There's an interesting sidelight to the Louisiana Purchase, too. Um, that's actually also tied up into Caribbean affairs, and something we'll talk about later. Uh, uh, who did the U.S. purchase Louisiana from? The French, okay? The French were willing to sell it because they had just uh, experienced a revolution in one of their colonies, which was, anybody know? It's called Saint-Domingue at the time. What's it called today? Haiti. 
Haiti. There was actually a slave rebellion in Haiti led by a slave named Toussaint Louverture. Once Haiti became independent, France lost a major sugar colony. And as a result of that, it didn't have the same interest, so it sells Louisiana because the port in New Orleans would have been crucial. It sells uh, uh, um, Louisiana, the whole Louisiana territory, to the United States. So this is part of globalization. The U.S. is able to double its geographic size because imperialism had failed. This traditional European imperialism had failed in Haiti, and it was able to, to acquire this new territory. But by far more important would be the acquisition of Indian lands, the taking of Indian lands. And you can see this early on, the Pequot Wars. Obviously, it was an example of that. Pequots were in Connecticut and uh, what is today uh, uh, Southern Connecticut and parts of Massachusetts. Uh, but, but you really see this uh, occur with a renewed vigor after uh, the War of, uh, uh, of 1812. Uh, in the War of 1812, a lot of Indians actually fought with the British against the Americans. Why would they do that? Because the Americans were taking their land away. So you start to see a, a really intensified and renewed attack on, on Indians then after that. The Indians are the greatest obstacle to internal development, to internal conquest. And um, the Americans really had no love for Native Americans. John Adams, great liberal founder of, of the United States, uh, was talking about the Indians in 1775. And he said, the Indians are known to conduct their wars so entirely without faith in humanity that it will bring eternal infamy on the ministry throughout all Europe if they should excite these savages to war. There was the idea there that the British would try to get the Indians to fight against the Americans in the War for Independence. The French disgraced themselves in the last war by employing them, French and Indian War, to let loose these bloodhounds to scout men and to butcher women and children is horrid. This is Adam speaking about Native Americans. And again, is the rhetoric that far off from what you might hear, you know, Al-Qaeda saying about, about Westerners or something like that, right? So uh, uh, clearly then the Indian lands are targeted and the person most responsible for this is, is Andrew Jackson, which is something you're probably familiar with. Um, Jackson, after the War of 1812, went after lands in the southeast, especially lands owned by the Cherokee and the Creek. And um, when the War of 1812 ended, Jackson and his cronies, they also had a particularly private interest in this because they started buying up lands from the Creek Indians that they had seized. Um, Jackson actually got himself appointed treaty commissioner uh, to the Creek, and he used this um, in order to get the largest session, the largest relinquishing of Indian lands uh, up to that time. Um, Andrew Jackson went to the Creeks when they protested the U.S. taking their land, and he said, listen, this is Andrew Jackson, listen, the United States would have been justified by the Great Spirit had they taken all of the Indian lands. Listen, the truth is the great body of the Creek chiefs and warriors did not respect the power of the United States. They thought we were an insignificant nation, that we would be overpowered by the British. They were fat with eating beef. They wanted flogging. We bleed our enemies in such cases to give them to their senses. This is Andrew Jackson. Right? That it was our, who, who, you know, it would have been justified by the great spirit. So who was Jackson invoking? Who wanted them to take that land? Who wanted, who wanted Jackson to take the creek land? God did, right? You can't say no to God, right? You just can't. You know, and they had it coming anyway. They were fat. They wanted flogging, right? We bleed our enemies in such cases to give them to their senses, okay? Now, if you heard some enemy of the U.S. say that, we would all be, you know, incredulous and justifiably so, but, you know, we have to kind of keep in mind this is part of a long-term historical uh, uh, context. Um, so in the period after the War of 1812, the U.S. acquires millions of acres of Creek and Cherokee land. This, however, will be nothing compared to what takes place subsequently, especially in the 1830s. Now, who's the President of the United States in the 1830s? Andrew Jackson. He's gone from being treaty commissioner to president, which gives him even more authority. And he goes after all of the Indian lands in the southeast. Okay, This is part, and, and this is really a great case study because it takes all of these uh, uh, themes into play. Why does, the, why does the government, why do these settlers, white settlers, this ruling class, why do they in particular want these lands? What, what will they do with them? Hmm? Farm, cotton. This is going to be the reason behind the cotton empire, 
these Cherokee lands, as the, as the land, Cherokee and Creek lands and other tribes, uh, Seminole in Florida, as they're removed from the southeast, American uh, planters will go into those areas and create these huge cotton plantations. This is going to be the reason behind the cotton empire. So it's about economic development. What is important about cotton? Cotton fuels the industrial revolution, right? So it's about industrialization because you use cotton in the textile mills. What else do you do with cotton? You trade it especially to the British. So cotton is really critical in terms of economic uh, uh, expansion, trade, and commercial development and markets. So it, it kind of fills it all up. And what else do you have when you talk about removing these? Well, you have the missionary aspect of it, right? Right? There's this kind of incredible civilized culture. And then on the other hand, you have these savages, right? So, I mean, it kind of, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great little morality play that takes all of this. It's a great case study that takes all of this into uh, account. So Andrew Jackson decides he's essentially going to remove, uh, in 1830 and 31, remove all of the uh, Native Americans from the Southeast. And now a lot of people stand up to this. The Supreme Court, for instance, the state of Georgia goes to, goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court tells Jackson he can't do it. And Jackson says, John Marshall, who's the chief justice, John Marshall's made his decision, let's see him enforce it. Right? What's Marshall going to do? Send the Supreme Court army out to, to stop me? Right? So um, Jackson uh, tells the Choctaw and, Ch and Chickasaw in December of 1830 to be ready for a speedy removal. Uh, uh, Jackson says, toward the aborigines of this country, no one, I'm sorry, do, do, do. toward the aborigines of this country, no one can indulge a more friendly feeling than myself. No one loves you more than I do. Toward the aborigines of the country, no one can indulge a more friendly feeling than myself. However, the wages of population and civilization are rolling to the west. And we now propose to acquire the countries occupied by the red men of the South and West by a fair exchange. It's evolution, it's development, it's modernization, it's history. We can't stop it, right? I mean, the great spirit wants this. And nobody loves you guys more than I do. But, you know, it's just, you know, you're in the way right now. As a result of that, this invasion occurs in the southeast. Looters and land speculators and people with whiskey and crooks and bandits and things like that. What was the, what, what Jackson says, fair exchange? What was fair exchange for most of the Indians? It was actually booze. I mean, one of the great negotiating ploys was just to flood Indian lands with so much liquor that they'd all, you know, get, get sick and sign treaties and things like that. Uh, you know, and of course it was force as well. So this invasion begins and the federal government uh, uh, decides to accelerate this process by forcing the Indians westward. And uh, uh, they begin this program now to forcibly remove Native Americans from the southeast to areas reserved for them in places like Oklahoma, right? One army colonel at the time was given this mission and he was very troubled by it. And he wrote a report which is really quite striking. And you could take this guy's words, which I think were written in the 1830s. I know they were written in the 1830s. I'm not sure precisely which year. You could take this guy's words, this army colonel's words, and you could put any, you know, kind of contemporary minority group in. And you would, it would be remarkably similar. Kurd, Palestinian, you know, whatever. You could throw that in there. South African before, uh, before uh, Mandela, and it would be appropriate. This is an army colonel's report in the 1830s, talking about the Indians who are being removed. They fear starvation on the route, and can it be otherwise when many of them are nearly starving now without the embarrassment of a long journey on their hands? You cannot have an idea of the deterioration which these Indians have undergone during the last two or three years, from a general state of comparative plenty to that of unqualified wretchedness and want. The free egress into their nation by the whites, encroachments upon their lands, even upon their cultivated fields, abuses of their person, hosts of traders who, like locusts, have devoured their substance and inundated their homes with whiskey, have destroyed what little disposition to cultivation the Indians may have once had. They are now browbeaten and cowed and imposed upon and depressed with the feeling that they have no adequate protection in the United States and no capacity of self-protection in themselves. This is a report of an army colonel. This sets the stage then for the so-called Trail of Tears where they are forcibly removed in the late 1830s. By this time, Jackson has left the White House and the president is Martin Van Buren. 
Van Buren in 1838 orders Major General Winfield Scott into Cherokee territory to use whatever military force necessary to remove the Cherokees westward. 4,000 soldiers and volunteers rushed into Cherokee country. General Scott, Winfield Scott, who would then become a hero of the uh, uh, Mexican-American War, which helps bring Texas into the Union, right, uh, says to the Indians, Cherokees, the President of the United States has sent me with a powerful army to cause you in obedience to the Treaty of 1834. This treaty, by the way, was signed with people who the U.S. government recognized as Cherokee leaders, not people the Cherokee themselves chosen as leaders. So the U.S. decided who the negotiating party, who the rulers of that particular tr country, native, you know, nation would be. That, that would never happen again, like in Iraq, would it? Where you know you get to pick who who you who you work with. Uh, um, so uh, they signed this, this treaty in 1834. It was signed with, with, with people who the Indians did not recognize. They were, to the Indians, these guys were sellouts. But the Americans recognized them and got their name on a treaty. So uh, 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 Scott says, the President of the United States has sent me with a powerful army to cause you in obedience to the Treaty of 1834 to join that part of your people who are already established in prosperity on the other side of the Mississippi. The full moon of May is already on the wane and before another shall have passed Every Cherokee man, woman, and child must be in motion to join their brethren in the far west. My troops already occupy many positions in the country that you are about to abandon, and thousands and thousands are approaching from every quarter to tender resistance and escape alike hopeless. Chiefs, headmen, and warriors, will you then, by resistance, compel us to resort to arms? God forbid. Or will you by flight seek to hide yourselves in mountains and forest and thus oblige us to hunt you down? Scott's words are quite clear. And the Trail of Tears commences in the spring of 1838. Uh, several tens of thousands of Indians leave the southeast. By the time they arrive, going on foot, thousands, 1,200 miles or so, uh, over half of them die. Okay, uh, and this is the so-called Trail of Tears when they arrive. At this point, the southeast is essentially open now for uh, commercial and uh, agricultural development. All right, it's an it's 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 really a telling narrative though because it does bring so many of these issues into focus. And again, I shouldn't even have to mention it. It should be clear as you read these accounts from an army colonel or from from Winfield Scott. You know. Uh, this rhetoric is remarkably similar. This view of the world is remarkably similar to a, to a 21st century view that a majority will have against a minority or an outside force will have against uh, uh, its enemy. Right? That goes without saying. At this point, then, the U.S. is clearly on the path. To, any questions, by the way? At any point, please. I know I'm talking a lot. By this time, then, the U.S. is clearly on the path toward continental power. It's established within the homeland now the means to eliminate obstacles to development. It's not remarkable that Indians become an obstacle to development. These things kind of tend to be seen in materialist terms. Now, there's always this missionary aspect to it as well. We're doing this for their sake. I mean, concurrent with the removal of the Indians was this attempt to civilize them, to bring them culture. So the U.S. tries to uh, get them to dress differently, to, to speak English. Uh, they start to create the schools, you know, where uh, a lot of times kids are taken away from their parents. And you'll see this all the way through the, the 19th century. Kids are taken away from their parents and sent to these schools so they can learn, you know, the kind of civilized ways. Their hair is cut and they're put in you know, starched white shirts and they're taught to speak English. And in this way, the U.S. is trying to cultivate and create kind of a, an Indian upper class that will be closely connected to uh, 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 Caucasian culture and Caucasian politics as well. So it's more than simply kind of seizing land. I mean, liberalism, I mean, that's crude. Liberalism isn't crude. Liberalism says, yeah, you take their land, but you also create institutions so that we can then, they can develop and they can create kind of a commodity culture, a consumer culture as well. So it's not simply, you know, let's, you know, kill them all and take their land and let God sort them out. It's really more than that. You know, to try to kind of show them the error of their ways, to bring them Christianity and virtue and whiteness, 
Right? That sounds kind of silly, but that's in fact what liberalism involves. This is what this kind of imperialism requires by necessity. All right? I mean, I think one of the real departures that we're seeing today in Iraq is that that's not really being attempted. I mean, this is really pretty much an occupation. You know what you're saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th these people who signed the treaties for removal, who really were not recognized by the Cherokee and Creek or the Choctaw, Chickasaw, or whatever. I mean, many of them stayed, and they were given a little plot of land, and they attempted to become kind of independent yeoman farmers, which is Indians never were. Indians were sedentary, and they traveled and whatnot. But yeah, and and they adapted. I mean. Uh, um, you know, they, they started, uh, you know, little Indian, you know, newspapers with, uh, you know, kind of English language papers, and they had schools, training schools, missionaries. I mean, missionaries are really big in this. One of the biggest targets, in fact, of the Indians, is, which you'll see all over the world, actually, is, is missionaries, because a lot of missionaries go into the southeast to try to convert these people, and quite often, they're, these are the guys who end up, you know, killed or, or attacked or whatever. You see the same thing in China in the, in the early 1900s. Missionaries are always getting beaten up and lynched and things like that in China too. So yeah, absolutely. And some do accept it. Some embrace it. I mean, for, for many different reasons. Some, you know, sincerely believe in it. Some see that this is the way to get ahead, to get along. You know, some of them do quite well. Most don't. Most reject it and they're, they're forcibly removed. So, um, and again, I mean, this is not nothing new at all. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you see throughout the entire. Any any great power operates that way toward its ethnic minorities. I mean, it's not a coincidence, is it, that Jackson refers to them as Aborigines? You know, if you look at any Aboriginal people, no matter where, they're going to be treated this way. Any ethnic minority. Look at the Kurds, you know, in Turkey or in Iraq, or the Palestinians or African Americans in the United States, especially before the Civil Rights Movement. You know, Native Americans. I mean, it's just you know the Soviet Union. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this, you know, when we get to, you know, soon we'll talk, I mean, this is one of the major reasons for American imperialism. Missionaries have a huge role to play in this. Ministers and people like that who really kind of want to go out and, 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 and really kind of Christianize the world. Now, not only is this because it's good for their souls, but it's also because it makes them more like us. And if they're more like us, what can they do? They can take the jobs, they can have jobs like us, they can operate like us, they can trade like us, they can buy like us. They can participate, right? And essentially, participation means purchase. Participation means be a consumer. Participation means you take part in a commodity society, all right? You can vote every four years, that's fine, but what's really important is to buy stuff and to, be, to market stuff and to make stuff and to be a merchant. I mean, that's, that's really what, what's really critical here. Right? So this is what missionaries are trying to do too. Not just save people's souls, but create a culture, create a society in which they can fully participate. And how do they fully participate? By being part of the market, part of the marketplace. All right? So this is really crucial, this idea of expansion. Yeah? Uh, yes, sir. With regard to the missionary mm -hmm. sense that they had, was it any different or was it just a continuation of, in the Southwest of what the Spanish had started with their missions? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not an expert at that. I, my suspicion is it's probably a little less, well, it's hard to say it's a little less coercive, probably not, not terribly different. I mean, when I think of Spanish conquests, you know, those tended to be kind of armies of occupation. Were, uh, missionary efforts under, uh, undertaken by the Americans Catholic, or were they... No, 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 no. No, they were, they were Protestant. They were mainly so congregationalist. Would it be and, that the Catholic missionaries might be in competition against the uh, Protestants? Oh, yeah, I mean, they're... they're and, and clearly, missionaries are anti-Catholic. I mean, there's there's a real. Uh, in the 1850s, there was this group called the Know Nothing Party, this nativist party, and they, they hated Catholics. The Ku Klux Klan. I mean, after blacks and Jews, Catholics were probably their greatest enemy. So no, this this whole sense of papacy was was really alarming because it was a foreign influence, right? You took your orders from Rome, and so no, no, there's there's clearly a, a difference there, and in that regard, it's probably different. What had been established with regard to missions by earlier settlers? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that history that well of the Spanish Catholic uh, aspects. My, what little I know of it, I mean, I always had the sense, and I could be way off, is that, you know, especially like the Jesuits always came and tried to actually kind of create, you know, kind of an educated elite class. And the missionaries are trying to do that too, but it, it's much different, I think. I think there was kind of a, a, 
I don't even know how to describe this because I don't know it that well. I think I think there's a distinction there because of that. But I mean, clearly the missionaries are. Yeah, you know. And then give it to some powerful Spanish lord, <coughs> and then he would preside over it. It was essentially a replica of what he had come. Yeah, to Spain. but I mean, how to, is that? Is that so the, the missionaries are? It's about a conquest. Yeah. So it, I mean, I don't. I think that's that's kind of a key difference. It's, it's, I don't think the Spanish effort is, is anyway liberal or is looking to no, no, no. Foreign people. It's looking to re replicate the Spanish national spirit. And, and, and I guess the problem I have is suggesting somehow that these missionaries in the Southwest or Southeast are trying to create a liberal establishment. They're really not. I mean, essentially, these guys are there as agents of, of empire, for the most part. I mean, they want to kind of take these people and make them more like us. They want to, they want to make them act white. They want to basically make them white, right? Caucasianize them, you know. And, and as part of that, I mean, you know, there's never this sense that they're going to be, you know, as good. I mean, there's still kind of a different power dynamic at play. But they certainly perceive themselves as reformists. Oh, absolutely. Well, sure. I mean, they're bringing the, the virtues of white so society to them. Yeah. That was where, um, in fact, before as a get them, he was in the Yeah. Soften them up. So you yeah. soften the blow. Yeah. Bit. Yeah, I, I'm really, you know, not no authority on, on Spanish missionary history, so. What? The exactly. Exactly. Now it's uh, Coca-Cola and jazz, and uh, it's it's culture. You know, it's uh, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, cable TV and big time wrestling and all that kind of stuff. So, anyway, um, with with this this acquisition of this new territory and this kind of creation of this new culture, the U.S. is is clearly set on this path toward continental empire. Um, and you can see this, you know, uh, uh, really concurrent with the acquisition of Indian lands. The first real, I think, assertive step uh, takes place in, in 1823 uh, when the U.S. announces the Monroe Doctrine, right? And you all know what the Monroe Doctrine is, right? It's a message to the Europeans basically saying Latin America, defined broadly. You know, all of this was part of the Spanish Empire, and the Spanish Empire is falling apart. And so all these countries are declaring their independence. So Latin America, defined broadly, is, is, is breaking away from the Europeans. And so what the Monroe Doctrine says is, you Europeans, leave them alone. Stay out. Okay? It says, uh, you, we will not accept any outside colonization in this area. This is our backyard. And then it says, we will not even accept, not just colonization, we will accept no intervention, no interference in this area. This is our backyard. And it also says, we won't go and mess around in your areas either. So it's a, it's a statement. It's a really assertive statement to the rest of the world saying, stay out. Stay out of Latin America. This is part of our sphere. This is part of the world that we have a specific interest in culturally, in terms of trade and everything else. Uh, at the same time, um, and we'll talk about this later, there's this real uh, kind of dream of expanding into that area, especially because of agriculture and slavery. So the Monroe Doctrine is a way to kind of, uh, you know, kind of say to the world, this is our area, we have plans for it, so we will not tolerate your interference here. And this takes place in 18. 23, and this is the first major statement, you know, kind of of America's global ambitions. They're pretty clear, but at the same time, this is kind of, it's written by John Quincy Adams, who's the Secretary of State, uh, and it's, you know, given by the President, James Monroe, hence the Monroe Doctrine. So, um, the Monroe Doctrine is kind of putting the world on notice. You really start to see this in the, in the successive generation come to fruition, especially in the period known as Manifest Destiny. It's a phrase, Manifest Destiny is really making a comeback because you're starting to hear very similar rhetoric in the late 20th, early 21st centuries in the administration. People like Clinton, big, you know. If you look at Clinton's rhetoric, it's really the rhetoric of Manifest Destiny. If you look at Bush's rhetoric, clearly the rhetoric of Manifest Destiny. One other thing I think you'll see as we go through here, at least I believe, is that there's a great deal of similarity in most of these, these periods. Uh, I don't kind of go into the whole Democrats do this and Republicans do that kind of thing. In fact, most of them are pretty similar. I mean, most of them have similar views of the world, 
you know, Clinton was was an arch imperialist. I mean, this guy had a vision of all of it. He was he was probably the most pro globalization leader that the U.S. has ever had. You know, clearly way up there. So uh, I'm not going to really create great distinctions that way. I think there's really pretty much a consensus. Uh, uh, and and in terms of manifest destiny, I mean, you really hear that kind of rhetoric. What's what's manifest destiny? It's pretty simple. Pretty much describes itself. What's what's your destiny? To extend westward all the way. That's what manifest destiny is. It says we're going to take it all, right? But is it because we're we want to? Is it because we? It's our destiny. You don't have a choice in it, right? And if it's manifest, who determines that that's your destiny? God, right? So basically what manifest destiny is saying is that God has given us this destiny. It's not, it's not even something we can choose. We can't even turn it down because it's our destiny, right? God has said that we have to expand all the way westward and then even into southern lands. And we have to take over areas where there are brown people and red people and yellow people. Okay? God wants that. And we have to do that in order to extend all these virtues that we already have. You know, republicanism and freedom and land and states' rights, which means slavery and free trade and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Right? And, and these people upon whom we are acting, how are they going to respond? They're going to embrace us. It's exactly it. So we're these. They're going to embrace this. Yeah. Is this designed to encourage the other peoples to accept us versus to engender support within the domestic It's population? both. It's both. I mean, the idea, you know, the, the people acted upon, you know, I mean, this is kind of, and missionaries are often, again, the, the advanced agents of this. You know, the idea there is, you know, look, look at what this is going to give you. You know, you can be educated, you can, I mean, you know, and, and missionaries bring education. I mean, the Spanish, that's one thing I was kind of trying to get at clumsily. I mean, the Spanish missionaries bring, this, the Jesuits especially bring education, the Europeans. All right? So the issue is, we'll educate you, and we'll teach you how to read, and you can become, you know, kind of, they didn't have the phrase middle class, but you can kind of become something more than you are now. So that's clearly this idea of manifest destiny. Is God wants this to happen to you, right? I mean, if, if I'm acting upon you, I'm going to say, God, God wants me to do this, and God wants you to accept it. And in the same way, yeah, it's a way to, to sell it at home as well by saying, you know, look, we don't really have a choice in this. It's, it's a very popular idea. Um, the term was actually coined up by a, a writer. But if you look, what's really remarkable, when I first read this, it was really hard for me to believe it, but people like um, Emerson and Whitman and Thoreau all were advocates of it early on. I mean, if you look at the stuff these guys said, they were all talking about, you know, Mexico is miserable and it's inefficient and there's a bunch of brown people down there. We need to bring them the virtues of our society. I mean, it's everybody. I mean, you really find very few critics of this idea as a theory in the 1830s and 40s. Now, you know, there are a lot of critics of, for instance, the, the war against Mexico and taking Texas. But in terms of the idea of manifest destiny, that's, that's very popular. There's kind of a national consensus that, you know, this is our responsibility. We are a great country. Country. God has made us so, and we have to give this. We have to extend these virtues and these blessings uh, elsewhere, right? And and it's our destiny. Now, obviously, you know whether you believe in God or not. God didn't make th th this. Was the act of men? These were rational decisions made by men. One historian has a great book on it. Instead of calling it manifest destiny, he calls it manifest design. What's that mean? Design. When you design something, you you, you put it together, you plan it, you think it through, right? It, destiny, you don't, you just, it just happens, right? But design means you're sitting there and you're, you're putting a program together. And this clearly was an act of design. And it acted upon, they acted upon non-white peoples, you know? And what was the net effect of it? What was the result of it? It did not bring them all these great blessings of virtue. It creates more dependencies. I mean, Latin America, really, until the late 20th century, is essentially a, a, you know, a, a subordinate of the United States. Most Latin American countries are. Not by American uh, imposition, although in Cuba, certainly, you know, you can make that case. Mostly by American proxies, by American influence. But clearly, this is a result of this idea of manifest destiny. You see the same thing with non-white peoples, Indians or, or African Americans or Mexican Americans. This idea is that, you know, we have to kind of slowly cultivate them in order to make them uh, uh, more like us, right? So uh, this is really crucial. This idea of manifest destiny becomes kind of the theoretical underpinning of expansion. And this is, this is clearly that, remember we talked about mission at the very beginning. I mean, again, it goes without saying, this is clearly a missionary impulse, isn't it? 
right? Now, the real light, you know, what's, what's the basis for it? Is it because, I mean, for a lot of people, it is genuine. Yeah, we do want to kind of make these people more like us because they'll be so much more happy if they dress like us and talk like us and act like us and look like us, right? It's like that song from the Jungle Book, I want to act like you and be like you and all that. I mean, it's just amazing. You want to talk about kind of cultural imperialism. You have, you know, I mean, Disney extending it. I'm kind of going off on one of my rants now. That I feel like Belushi and the Germans are about to bomb Pearl Harbor. But, uh, I mean, so a lot of people are sincere about that. They believe it. But, but, but why? You know, is it just to bring the people, the, these, these brown, our little brown brethren, is it to bring them the virtues of our society? Is that why the U.S. is, you know, interp interposing in these areas? Is that it? No, I mean, it's, it's obviously more than that, right? These are areas which would be ripe for, for cultivation. These are agricultural areas. And we'll talk about it later. There's, there's a, 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 if you want to trade, if you want to trade uh, with Asia, you need a canal, right? It'll make life so much easier rather than going all the way down to the tip of South America. You can cut through. So you want a canal. You need territory for that. Uh, uh, if you want to extend the slaveocracy, if you want to extend the states which will allow slaves, then Latin America's great for that, right? Because it's agricultural. Southern states, they would come in, we could adopt them, we could bring slaves, we could have slaves there. Right? So all of this is the basis for it. Now, you tell these people you're doing it for their own sake. I'm doing this for you. It's like this parental thing, right? This hurts me more than it hurts you. I'm doing this for your own good, and you'll be happy. You know, Once you look like me and dress like I do and talk like I do and read the things I do and go to church every Sunday morning like I do and, and know the Bible like I do, you'll be so happy. Your life will be complete. All right? I mean, you know, that's, that's a hustle. We know it is now. Okay? I mean, some people do adopt. Some people do adapt. But most don't. Most become essentially acted upon. And Latin America and uh, 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 non-white peoples in the U.S. remain in a state of underdevelopment for over a century. We know that. And that's not, that's simply, you know, data. That's, that's not even an interpretation. It is underdeveloped. Is it underdeveloped because of this kind of paternal interventionist imperial attitude? We can debate that. I think clearly it is. Okay. So as a result of that, then, uh, 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 this idea, which is really kind of accepted by consensus. Yeah. Sure. That same attitude that you're talking about, isn't that reflected, at least with Latin America, in more modern events, you know, post-50 with Washington consensus and, and uh, our implementation of I, I would argue, yeah. He was, he was asking for, for the... Well, um, I mean, I, I think that, that, that people in Washington would suggest that the Cuban Revolution or the Sandinista Revolution or uh, the, the, the debt crisis or Lula or, or Chavez in Venezuela would be the consequences of that. And that, to them, that would be bad. But I think it's part of a kind of, a, you know, in Latin America, one, one of the way Latin American scholars look at this is see something called dependency theory. And you have a, you know, a, 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 in dependency theory, you have a core, the, the powers, in this case, the United States. And then you have the periphery, which would be the Latin American countries. And there's a dependency, right? They're dependent upon the U.S. Now, no one's talking about dependency theory in the 1830s and 40s, but you still have a similar, the idea here is that you have this epicenter, which is, which is you know, D.C., it's, 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 it's the United States. And then you have these kind of satellite countries, this periphery, which is acted upon. You do this by sending in missionaries or you send in armies, in the case of, 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 of Texas. And, and yeah, you, you know. Uh, in the 20th century, you'll send in bankers, or you'll send in, uh, what's the thing? Um, oh, Jesus, I'm trying to believe. In the 1960s, you know, the, the hippie kids who went in and taught people how to farm and stuff. Peace Corps. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, you know, Belushi, anybody that joined the Peace Corps now. Um, in Alliance for Progress. Alliance for Progress, right, right. But, I, I mean, I think, you know, we see those as kind of liberal, humanitarian, missionary things. Oh, we're sending people in there to teach them. Kinky Friedman, if any of you ever heard of Kinky Friedman, he's a, he had a band and he also writes detective novels, but he was sent to Borneo to work in the Peace Corps. And he said, they sent me to Borneo, where people had been farming independently for 2,000 years to teach them agricultural techniques, right? So, I mean, to us, it seems like, oh, this cute little, you know, these kind of kids are going there. But to, to, to the people who are being acted upon, I think in, the, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's imperial. It's like, what the hell are they here? We know how to do this. We can take care of our own society. We can take care of our own culture. We don't need these white people coming in here telling us how to do things or what to do. All right? I mean, and, and, and as a result of that, I mean, you know, we can, we can kind of make jokes about it. But a lot of these people are targeted. I mean, you know, if you look at the litany of missionaries who were attacked or killed in the third world in the early 20th century, it's quite impressive. In every country, there are anti-missionary attacks. You see it all over, 
right? I mean, these people are, you know, kind of, in a sense, have metaphorical bullseyes on their backs for that reason. Uh, the people acted upon may not take it in the way it's offered, right? I mean, a missionary can come down and say, oh, we want to bring you, you know, all these great things, but that's not going to be accepted that way. And clearly, I mean, you can see in the 1840s it's not being accepted that way. And as a result of that, I don't want to go into great detail on Oregon and Texas. You probably know it already. But, you know, the, the test case for manifest destiny succeeds wildly, right? The U.S. takes Oregon. Why is Oregon important? Up in the Northwest, lumber, but what else? Even more importantly, think big. It's, it's owned by the British, but why physically is Oregon important? Pacific gives you access to the ports, right? Okay. So you have access to the Pacific, and ultimately, and this is something we'll talk about more and more, if you have access to the Pacific, what can that eventually take you to? Asia. And Asia is really crucial here. This is everybody's fantasy, Asia, because Asia has you know, millions and millions of people already. Can you imagine those markets if you can start selling stuff in Asia? So Oregon is critically important, obviously, because it gives you access to ports, to the Pacific, ultimately to Asia. Uh, um, the story of Texas we're already pretty familiar with, right? Texas is Mexican land. There's a dispute. Mexico is independent. Uh, there's real chaos within Mexico over who will run the central government. There's a border dispute. Is the border of the Rio Grande? Is it the Nueces River? And, uh, uh, you know, as a result of that, the Americans will physically intervene to take uh, 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 Texas by force, all right? Um, why don't we take a, a brief break now and then we'll come back when the green light comes back on. All right.